Welcome everyone to the Moth Like Story Night, a Manchester Community Library event that's co-sponsored by Northshire Bookstore. I'm Cindy Waters, the library's adult programming coordinator. Tonight, I'm being assisted by Ray Stevens, MCL's information technology and instructional librarian, who is a whiz at all things tech. Thank you, Ray, for handling the Zoom meeting tonight. I'd like to take this opportunity to give a shout out to the Northshire Bookstore. It is always a pleasure to partner with them. Please support Manchester's independent bookstore. It's incredible. And they support your public library. Every year, public li libraries throughout the country offer summer reading programs. Perhaps you participated in one when you were a child or even you do as an adult. Last year, Manchester Community Library extended our summer reading program to include adults. And it was such a success that we decided to repeat it. This year's nationwide theme is Imagine Your Story. So tonight's event is part of our summer reading program initiative. To participants in our summer reading challenge for adults, which runs through August 15th, read two books that are either a memoir, biography, or are novels that take you to another place or time, and then go to mclvt.org and fill out our online form. You'll be entered in the grand prize drawing. So tonight's Zoom meeting is being recorded. Just wanted everyone to know that. Everyone will be muted except for the MC or the storyteller on stage, so to speak, um, at the imaginary mic. We invite you to use the chat feature. It's been a pleasure to plan tonight's unique virtual storytelling event with Bennington storyteller, Michael Nigro. He was very receptive to the idea of trying an online event and has been the guiding force in conceptualizing this. And I'm delighted to introduce Michael. Manchester Community Library thanks him for emceeing tonight's event. So after telling a story at a local event eight years ago, Michael Negro became a frequent storyteller in Bennington and throughout Vermont. He emcees events in Bennington and for several years has emceed a national healthcare conference. Following a short period working as a paid game show clapper in LA, yes, that's really on his resume here, um, Michael worked in healthcare for 18 years and now owns a catering and concession business. He and his wife, Sarah, live in a former church in Bennington. Over to you, Mike, thank you. Thank you very much, Cindy. And uh, uh, I did include the uh, game show clapper in this. It's not on my actual resume, I should point that out. Um, so I, I'm a big believer that stories are important. Uh, the way we tell stories and the stories we choose to tell say a lot about who we are and help shape who we are. Um, and I often say that I'm either telling stories or living stories. And I think for the last four and a half months, I've probably, uh, probably a lot of us have been living the stories. I imagine in the years to come, there's going to be uh, some interesting stories we tell about this period. But tonight, we'll be able to forget about masks and incessant hand washing for a little bit of time and enjoy hearing some stories. So, uh, Cindy mo uh, mentioned most of our housekeeping, but uh, just a quick note uh, that it, if you haven't already, it might be worth switching to uh, speaker view. If you're on a computer, uh, a, uh, a PC or a laptop, you would do that by clicking up on the, the speaker view button in the upper right hand corner. If you're on a phone, it probably uh, defaults to speaker view already. Um, and again, everybody is going to be muted. This is a, a little bit different for a lot of us storytellers because oftentimes we're used to hearing from and interacting with the crowd. Um, so a little bit different. At the end of the event, Ray does plan to uh, try to unmute everybody uh, for a moment to be, uh, be able to show some appreciation for our storytellers. I expect that to be uh, possibly a chaotic disaster and I look very forward to it. So. Uh, with that, um, 
we will start uh, to introduce our storytellers of the evening. We will have seven stories. And our first storyteller, Bob Stannard, is an eighth generation Vermonter who has served in the legislature, worked as a logger, a lobbyist, a columnist for three papers, and a commercial real estate broker, and mowed lawns. He retired from a 30-year career in Vermont politics to play music, write, and enjoy his family. Bob has been a performing artist, playing and singing the blues since 1969. He's recorded three albums and is the author of two humor books, How to Survive the Recession, a Vermont Perspective, and a follow-up, How to Survive the Recovery, a Vermont Perspective. With that, let's welcome Bob Standard. to unmute. How's that? You hear me all right? So thanks for having me. Thanks to the library. Thanks to the bookstore. Thanks to the person that gave me the big bad Bob hat. So life was good in the 50s and 60s growing up in South Dorset, Vermont. We had a lot of fun. We played, but we also had obligations. They were not written down. They were just uh, uh, unspoken things that you kind of had to do. And one of those things was, uh, if you were a young boy and I was 11 years old, <clears throat> I had to go over and give Jimmy Kelleher a hand on his little farm on West Road. He'd been in a car accident and ended up with a bad hip and he was getting along in years. And I just went over and helped him paint the barn and work on equipment and mess around with the cows and do whatever he needed to do and that a, a, a young kid could do. Well, there came a time where he'd, he would just call his cows, you know, he'd just let them out and they'd go up to the flats way up behind his house and hang out like cows do. And he'd call them at the end of the day and they'd come home, you know, unlike most kids. Anyway, uh, so there was a night that he called and all but one of the cows came home. He said, well, you know, we got a minute there. We ought to go see if we can find that cow sometime. Not tonight. We'll look, do it tomorrow, maybe next day. So I go back over to the farm and we're messing around, working around it's in the afternoon. And he said, uh, Bobby, you want to go see if we can find that cow? And I said, sure. So I go to hop in this bucket loader uh, that he had. And I, he had to sit in the bucket if you were one of the younger kids. The older kids had the high honor of sitting up on the fender with Jimmy. But the little kids had to sit in a steel bucket and bounce around like a marble in a tin can. So I go to get in the bucket. And he goes, Bobby, why don't you come on up here and sit on the fender with me? Well believe me this is you have no idea what a high honor this is to sit on the fender with Jimmy going up to the class so we get up there and I'm you know I'm feeling pretty darn cool I'm sitting on the tractor having a good time and we can't find this cow anywhere we've been calling and hunting and hunting and calling and finally I look way down at the other end of the field and I said what's that down there he said I don't know let's go take a look so we putter our way down there and we come upon <clears throat> what originally would have looked like a cow, but this cow looked more like a cow that would have been seen in the Macy's Day Parade. This cow was bloated to a degree that I've never seen in my early 11 years of life. Even now at 69, I don't think I've seen another cow look like this. This cow was enormous and just perplexingly bizarre looking. Oh dear, said Jimmy, she must have been hit by lightning in that storm. And I said, oh, man, I hope I never get hit by lightning. So he said, I said, what are we going to do with this cow? He said, well, I think we just got to bury him right here. So he digs a hole with his bucket, not a deep grave, deep enough. And uh, I'm, so here's the tractor, here's the cow, and here's little Bobby Standard weighing about 90 pounds. <clears throat> and uh, he's getting ready to push the cow in the hole. I'm absolutely mesmerized at this whole thing. Believe me, I've never seen a burial. I've never seen a cow the size of a European car with a distorted face. And he looks at me and he says, uh, you might want to stand back a little bit. So I moved back, I don't know, three inches because I'm not going too far. I got to see this. He touches the cow with the bucket and I don't know exactly what happened or how or why but the cow exploded. Now, if you were to come up behind me at this precise moment in time, you would see a little skinny 11 year old South Dorset kid with a white t-shirt, blue jeans and sneakers and look like a normal person. 
But if you'd come around the other side, you'd see that same little boy covered in green and intermittent brown stuff that smelled unlike anything in the universe. It was the most disgusting thing. So at first there was this shock and awe of what the heck was that? And then there was this overpowering odor of pure raw disgust. And then I looked down at the rest of me and I said, oh my heavens, how do I find a way to get out of my skin? So I just stand there. Jimmy, of course, doesn't say a word. I think I see the corner of his mouth go up just a hair, but he was very expressionless human being. So he stuffs the what's left of this blown up cow into the hole, buries the cow up, and he says, uh, okay, you ready to go? And I said, I'm, I'm ready actually to die in my skin right now. I'd prefer to have joined the cow. And so he says, come on, let's go. And I start to get up on the tractor, and he goes, no, nah, no, nah, you better ride in a bucket insult to injury i've lost my high throne of the fender i now have to sit in a bumpy bucket we go all the way back down the, the log road back to the farm i can't believe how disgusting i am and we stop the tractor and jimmy looks at me and says i know your mom and i'm thinking well, of course you they all grew up together of course you know my mom well she's not going to want you going in the house with them clothes on so I'm thinking, I don't want to go in the house with my skin on. So there's a moral to this story, and that is very simple. When a Vermont farmer says to you, back up a little, what he's really saying is back up a lot. Thank you, Bob. Uh, Bob, I'm, uh, I've never had the pleasure of seeing a cow explode before. Um, it's not necessarily a pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting. I mean, it's interesting. Story. It's very interesting. Stand back. B before we let you go, um, I, I, I'm going to put you on the spot. I, I'm interested uh, in, in asking, you know, the last four and a half months have been an unusual time with the uh, social distancing and the pandemic. Have, has there anything, anything that's been a surprise or anything you've learned over the last four and a half months? Well, most people don't like me all that much, so social distancing hasn't been all that big a deal for me. But I will tell you one thing, when they close the schools, I say, well, that's too bad. My little grandchildren are just gonna, you know, uh, drop out of school, and then that'd be fine. Uh, but no, my wife is a teacher of 25 years at Floodbrook School, and said, we'll homeschool them. I said, that's great, I'll be fishing. And she said, no, you're gonna be the assistant teacher. Well, so here's what I've learned about COVID-19. Okay, it's a horrible virus, it makes you sick, it makes you die, it's just a terrible thing. But what I did learn is if you are an assistant teacher in a homeschool program, number one, it's a lot of work. Number two, the pay is unbelievably horrible. So I think the teacher's contracts in Vermont will sail through like you know what through a goose over the next year or so. Well, thank you. Kind of like the cow I was just talking about. <laughs> well, thank you, Bob. Uh, once again, thanks to Bob Stannard, um, and uh, I'm, I'm imagining a virtual round of applause. This is where it's a little unusual being online, and, uh, and I'm going to uh, go ahead and move on and introduce our second storyteller. Dave Canal was born in Middlebury, Vermont, a long time ago, his words, and has not lived outside of Vermont and does not intend to leave anytime soon. He has lived in Manchester since the late 60s, where he and his wife Paula have raised a large family of active boys and girls. As typical Vermonters, uh, he has made a living performing a variety of jobs. Among other things, he's been a baker, a builder, a bartender. He's made, made maple syrup, milked cows, and put up hay. Dave is the author of a trilogy, Grandpa's Memoirs. Uh, welcome, Dave Connect. Hi, everyone. How are we doing? Uh, I guess I'll get right to it, because that's what we got to do. I guess you can hear me okay, everybody? Cindy or whatever? Okay. Uh, recently, my wife Paul and I have been having uh, kind of a lot of fun by putting stuff out at the end of the driveway with a free sign. It's uh, incredible. Whatever, no matter what we put out there, it's like magic. It disappears. It's gone. And it's been kind of fun. It's kind of interesting. We actually like the process because it allows us to get rid of some household goods that we don't need anymore. Uh, someone's going to get something of value. 
and it saves it from uh, going to the landfill. So it's been kind of fun to clean out some things and have it do that. Well, it was a few, uh, few years ago, it was time for us to uh, redo the bedroom in a process that needed to get uh, painted and needed new carpet. And for me to do that, we had to remove all the furniture. And I'm pulling out this old recliner, this old tired recliner uh, that was like an old friend of mine. It had nursed me back to health several times through a couple of hip replacement surgeries and nasty rotator cuff and shingles and a few other of those ailments that we seem to get as we meander down the path called aging. Well, as I was bringing that recliner out, I was just going to put it in the shop or garage and throw it in the truck. And when I did a dump run and a recycle run, I said, I'll get rid of it then. And then I thought, you know, maybe I'll just put this out with a free sign. Do you suppose someone would take it? Well, <laughs> a little while later, someone did show up. They were trying to get it in the back of the trunk and call a hollow to him says uh, the back, you know, the back comes off it. So in the trunk it went uh, and off they went, gone. Uh, and then another time, it was just recently, that I guess it was last fall, it was time to retire some old Adirondack chairs that we had at the library that kind of served, served their purpose. And sure enough, I said, I'll just throw those in the back of the truck. I'll put them, bring them home, put them out at the end of the driveway, put the free sign, and sure enough, they'll be gone. There was eight of them, I think, when I started. I know there was. And uh, I looked out mid-afternoon, and there was two of them had already gone, and there were six of them there. And then about 4.30, I noticed this lady taking the chairs and putting them into my garage. My garage. Well, I guess Paula wanted those chairs. So I just kind of put them up over the garage, out of sight, you know, out of mind, and won't have to worry about it again. But this spring, uh, with a coronavirus protocol, and I got plenty of time to stay home and do some other things, I dragged them down out into the shop, and I cleaned them up and glued them and screwed them together and painted them up. And uh, actually, they're like better than new. And uh, there they are out back. They're a nice compliment uh, to our backyard and uh, in the patio. And I'm really glad, glad I thought of saving them. And they worked out just fine. And then there was the other time that uh, I had this lawnmower that didn't run. And with today's uh, ethylon, ethanol gas, kind of gums up the carburetors. And I just wasn't up to that task. I said, I'll just push it out to the end of the driveway and see what happens. Just knowing that someone would come along that was kind of handy with that and they'd fix it up, and they'd have themselves a service a lawnmower. So sure enough, when I got back home that night, the lawnmower was gone. But when I got home the next night, it had been returned. Not the way it works. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Uh, I, I will mention that uh, I am constantly trying to bring things to the dump, and with my wife yelling at me, no, just put it on the curb. You don't have to worry about it. It works. Yeah. I, it works. I'm always telling you, nobody will take this. Somebody takes it. Well, that's what I'm saying. No matter, no matter what we put out there, it is gone. Although we haven't had a return yet, and you have. <laughs> that's, uh, Dave, that's not the deal. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, any, uh, any final uh, lesson or surprise uh, that, that you've uh, found uh, you know, from during the last four and a half months of, of this pandemic? Yeah, I guess... Um, Right off the start, right off the bat, you know, it was just kind of went the way that I thought, certainly here in Vermont, you know, uh, us uh, uh, determined, uh, red, resilient uh, Vermonters, you know, just doing the resolve to handle the right things and do the right things and, and try to get as much information as we could and process it so we can be safe and so our neighbors can be safe. And let's figure out how to get through this. But I think sadly, and this seems to be developing, it seems to be getting worse, it is just getting awfully nasty out there. You know, it's getting nasty about where people are from and what they're doing and this type of thing. And I, I guess I'm really disappointed that maybe it's only 10% or less of the people that are doing that, but it seems to be getting nastier and nastier. I'm just really disappointed that that's what, what's come of it. Well, I certainly hope, uh, hope that observation uh, perhaps can turn around and, and hope that isn't the final answer on that one. But uh, I certainly understand that. Well, Dave, thank you again. Appreciate thank you. It. Um, so moving on, uh, I am actually going to uh, tell a, a brief story. I, I'm going to tell a story of my greatest athletic achievement of my entire life, which also is the most embarrassing athletic achievement of my entire life. 
Uh, when my, about 15 years ago, my brother discovered the existence of ultra marathons. Now, I don't even understand wanting to run a marathon, let alone long, going longer than a marathon. Uh, but he, my brother became obsessed with wanting to run 100 miles. And as part of this, uh, he started training and, and for well over a year. And my father, uh, because his philosophy is uh, crazy, should always have company, decided he was also going to train and try to run this 100 mile event with my brother. And uh, after a little over a year of training, uh, they went to Raleigh, North Carolina for the Umstead 100 mile event. And I met them and I had a couple jobs I was there for. Uh, I am not interested at all in running, so I, that wasn't what I was there for. Uh, instead, I uh, was there to meet them. It was a 12 and a half mile loop that they had to do uh, repeatedly and uh, there were checkpoints along the way, and I had to meet them here and there to give them dry socks or, uh, or Tylenol or uh, an energy bar. Uh, and the more important job I had is that the last 15 miles, if they made it to 85 miles, which they weren't sure if they would, but if they did, the event required that you had somebody go with you the last 15 miles, because after running over 85 miles, and oftentimes that would take people over 24 hours to do it, people were so exhausted and incoherent and running in the middle of the night through the woods uh, that they were worried about safety. So they wanted somebody fresh, a pacer, to go with them, to keep an eye on them, make sure they were okay. So that was gonna be my job. So a little bit before the sun came up one morning, the, the race began and my father and my brother ran off to, to run 100 miles. And uh, for the entire, uh, we watched the sun come up, and uh, then for the rest of that day, I met them every few hours to give them uh, uh, some supplies and keep them uh, up, you know, with, keep them in with everything they need. Um, during that time, though, I got to sit back and watch a little bit about this event. Now, I shouldn't have to tell you how crazy it is to, to run 100 miles. That sounds absurd to most people. But having seen it first person, there's a few things I can say that, like I saw things that clarified just how insane this is. Uh, I saw a person actually get to a checkpoint and decided their blisters were too bad for any sort of actual bandaging. So they wrapped their feet in duct tape and ran on. I saw another gentleman that came into one of the checkpoints where they had medical personnel always there to make sure it was safe. And he comes in and he's leaned all over to the side as he jogs in. And the medical personnel came right up to him. They were concerned he must be having a stroke. But he just smiled. He says, no, no, this just happens. I have, I have a bad right side. And on he went. The next time I saw him at another checkpoint, he was running with a rock extended on his other side to try to counterbalance himself. This is absolute madness. Uh, and I personally, as I said, had no interest, just there to support my father and my brother. So uh, on they went. Uh, unfortunately, uh, around 75 uh, miles, my father was not able to continue. Uh, medical personnel uh, asked him his birth date, and he was not able, uh, despite repeated attempts, to, to give his birth date. Um, so my brother at that point was running on himself, and uh, the sun set after the first day, and he ran through the night. And finally, he gets to mile 85 and to a certain checkpoint that I'm supposed to meet him at, to run the final 15 miles with him. Um, so off we go. It's the middle of the night. He's been running for 85 miles and close to 24 hours. And I uh, have been up for that long. And off we start running. Now, I'll tell you, I thought in advance that this wasn't going to be a big deal. He was going to be going slow. And in fact, he was because he's pretty tired at that point. But after a couple miles, I realized, gosh, I don't think I've done anything this you know, strenuous in a really long time. And I start struggling a little bit. Plus I'm really tired and it's the absolute middle of the night. And during the day I'd eaten at Burger King three times while they were doing the run and I wasn't really feeling that great. And somewhere we're about halfway through the 15 miles I was supposed to run to get him to the end, I start having this fear that I'm not gonna make it. I'm the pacer, I'm supposed to be the one there making sure he's safe. And I'm actually worried that I'm not gonna be able to complete it. 
at some point, I turned to him and said something along the lines of, there's no shame in 93 miles. He actually looked at me for a moment and just said, shut up. And on we went. I dug deep. And I, the, when the sun came up, and it was the second sunrise that my brother watched while running, when the sun came up, I felt enough of a burst of energy to go, I'm going to make it to this. I'm going to finish it. So I remember coming up the final stretch, and there's a finish line off in the distance, and we're coming in, and just before we crossed the finish line, I looked at my brother, and he looked like hell. He looked absolutely terrible. He looked like he had run 100 miles. He looked like he'd been up for 28 hours that he'd been running. And we walk through the finish line, and people swarm around him, and they slap him on the back, and they congratulate him, and they shake him. And a moment later, they swarm around me. And they grab me, and they shake me, and they start congratulating me. And at that moment, I realize I also look like hell. And I also look like I've run 100 miles. And I'm too embarrassed to tell them I'm just a pacer. So I did the only thing I could. I puffed up my chest. I leaned back. I said, thank you. And I basked in the glory of victory. Thank you. Um, I will note, uh, in terms of uh, pandemic lessons, I have many. I've learned a lot, anything from how many consecutive hours my wife can put up with me, which luckily is more than most people. Um, but uh, maybe my biggest takeaway is that uh, uh, a lawn is a worthy adversary. I watched the older gentlemen in my neighborhood and they seem to make it look so easy. They out there dabble, they just poke around, they putter in the yard and it looks brilliant. Whereas I have been desperately trying to make a nice yard and, and I might officially be giving up and simply deciding that I appreciate the beauty of dandelions. So uh, with that, uh, I'm going to introduce our next storyteller. Leah Moore uh, is a high school English teacher and theater teacher who believes in the power of sharing stories. She is the proud mo mother of three children, Jordan, who has a Krita Shah, a rare chromosome chromosomal disability, and five-year-old twins. She believes parents need a place to empath empathize with one another, uh, one another, and life's odyssey can be best handled with kindness and a sense of humor. She's just finished her first memoir about finding joy, navigating the unexpected, and you can follow her stories on her family blog, lovingyoubig.com. So with that, welcome Leah Moore. Working on- All on right, hi All right. everybody. You Thank you so much for having me. I am a New Yorker, but my heart lives in Manchester and Northshire is my most favorite place in the entire world. So this is a real honor for me. Um, so I'll also just jump right in. So my, uh, my story is about my turning point as a mom when uh, a man yelled at me from the parking lot of the grocery store. So he had must have seen us shopping in the grocery store and wanted to comment on my parenting. It was our first time going without a stroller. I was a part of the cutest handholding I have ever been a part of. So to my right was my daughter, Jordan who at the time was age six, and she was wearing a pink tutu dress that she was convinced Panina Tournay designed as a result of watching too many episodes of Say Yes to the Dress, but really we just got on sale at Costco. And she was holding hands with one of the twin tornadoes, Twin B, named Oliver, who would not leave the house unless he had on his sister's arm warmers and her matching hat. And I was holding hands with Twin A, Austin, who had some sort of combination of applesauce and guacamole on his face. We were quite a group. So it took us 10 minutes to get through the door. As I said, it was our first time without a stroller. So we were there for a mission. We had not only graduated from the fact that my daughter may never walk or talk, but she was moving on to practical life skills. So when she was 18 months old, Jordan was diagnosed with a very, very rare condition called Kritasha, which is a deletion of the fifth chromosome. And the cognitive delays are massive and we were told she would never walk or talk. So to be here just a few years later, working on identifying items at a grocery store was a miracle. 
she had spent the last four months working on four items that she used um, using a PEX system, a picture exchange communication system. And the big haul included strawberries, popsicles, um, milk, and chocolate chip muffins. So we walk into the store. We are greeted by a fellow shopper that says, it looks like your hands are full. And I hear my chipper voice say, yes, it's our first time without the stroller. And despite the fact that two of my three children wear orthotics and one wasn't even supposed to walk, they're suddenly faster than I can ever imagine and go running towards the berries. So someone needs to tell the people at the produce area that the berries are the exact wrong height for two-year-olds because each twin has taken five cartons of blueberries and tried to throw them in the shopping cart but they're a little too short to make them reach nicely. So we are now surrounded by an avalanche of spherical berries. Austin's on the ground eating them, Oliver's hysterically laughing, and our fearless leader Jordan says, not on the list, let's keep going. So now I've bribed Austin with the berries I couldn't return to the carton. Inside the cart, it's a gentle reminder to wash your produce before you eat it. And Oliver's grabbing my nose and singing me a song and a man at the deli counter says, wow, it really looks like you have your hands full. I never go grocery shopping with my children. To which I smile because what else are you supposed to do? And realize I only have two of my three boisterous children. Jordan is nowhere to be found. So the pit that lives in my stomach as a special needs, needs mom has now just exploded. We've put stickers inside her shoes to help her identify who she is, but she doesn't have a lot of language to tell us who she is, and this is my worst nightmare realized. I grab the twins, I'm running up into me, down the aisle shouting, has anyone seen a, a little girl in a rainbow wig with a pink dress? There can't be many in the store. And I stop at the snack aisle and I see her holding a bag of pretzels and she says, hi mommy, not on list, keep going. I swallow that one down, we move on, I'm ready to get out of the store, it's time for the milk. We walk past a maintenance worker and his full ass crack leaning over the lobster tank. Jordan turns to me and says, look mommy, tushy. I say, yes honey, that is a tushy, grab the milk, now let's keep going. Aisle four, it's time for the popsicles. A very sweet, slow-moving elderly woman with a carton full of cantaloupes stops us to mention how full my hands look. She's not happy with my choices. I tell her we're going to do our best and move on. I've given the children a box of popsicles to consume. I actually grab a second box because the bribery is working. We've already devoured most of the first box. And of course, I don't have any wipes with me. At this point, we have one item left and it's time to go. I compliment Jordan on her shopping skills. This is a very, very big deal, and I want her to know how proud of her I am. And we come to the aisle for the chocolate chip muffins, and I can see, like a glaring spotlight, they are sold out. So if you've ever been near a child, let alone one with special needs, the expectation versus reality is a big space, and I was prepared for a gigantic meltdown. I wasn't very far from the beer aisle, I'm not really a drinker, but it could be a contingency plan. So I calmly said, Jordan, we could have blueberry muffins. And she said, no, chocolate chip muffins. So we walk up, she sees they're not there. She takes a giant breath and says, okay, list done, let's go home. So this momentous achievement practically makes me float out of the grocery store. And for the record, not only did we not float, but Oliver knocked over a candy bar display Austin signed the credit card receipt and Jordan serenaded all of the uh, people in the store with a very inappropriate version of Ariana Grande's Side to Side, not a song you want your child to sing. 50 minutes later, five zero minutes later, I get everybody in the car with four items in our bag. I lock everybody's car seats, take a deep breath, and I hear from behind me a man shout at me from his steering wheel, hey lady turn around and I said, yes. And he said, hey, I saw you in the store. And with a very red face, I said, I am so sorry. It was our first time going grocery shopping without the stroller. And he interrupts me and he says, you are a great mother. Have a really nice day. And he drove away.
And what I wanted to say to that man was, thank you. I will have a great day. But first, I have to figure out how to get milk, popsicles, and strawberry into a meal because while we were at the grocery store, I didn't have any time to get anything for dinner. Thank you. Leah, thank you. That was absolutely wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, I will, I'll put you on the spot like everyone else. Uh, any special uh, discoveries or anything you've learned uh, over the course of the pandemic? Yeah, so I'm, um, I'm in a house with these three children, two of them who have special needs. My husband and I are both teachers. So we are multitasking. We are finding joy in the smallest moments. Um, and I have had a pretty passionate relationship with my sweatpants and a new vacuum cleaner that can get under the couch and get all the Cheerios. So I feel pretty successful about that. Um, and I'm just grateful that my family and friends are safe and happy to be in the chaos um, until the world is ready for us to come back out. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. And, uh, and perhaps uh, you could uh, uh, type your blog into the chat feature too, in case folks uh, uh, didn't get a chance to write that down when I said it, but, but would be interested in, in uh, following that. I'll put it there. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So our next storyteller is a friend of mine and a, uh, a longtime storyteller in Bennington. Jennifer Jasper is honored to be part of Story Night. She was a transplant to Bennington, Vermont from Seattle, Washington. She was host to many shows and performed and directed all over Seattle for 25 plus years. Most recently, she accepted the job of executive director of the Bennington Performing Arts Center, home of Old Castle Theater. Uh, an award-winning playwright, her collection of shorts, Pressing Matters, premiered at Theater Row in New York City in April of 2017. She is ready to tell, so ready. <laughs> Jennifer Jasper. Hey, um, thank you, Mike. Um, I hope I'm unmuted, can you hear me? Yes, awesome. Oh, it doesn't flip for me, it's weird, okay. So, um, no one's talking about the pandemic. I'm gonna be doing a little time travel in mine tonight, uh, my story, and I'm also breaking a rule, but I'll you'll know that at the end. Um, so, during the last four and a half months, I've been, you know, all of my stories kind of go back to my childhood. Um, I find that that's where I resonate. And 1973 has been coming up again and again and again in my brain. And that is because in 1973, I was 10 years old. And um, I am the middle of five girls and two older sisters and two younger sisters. I am directly in the middle, um, age-wise, directly in the middle. And then both my parents, and we had a beagle named Ralph. And during this summer, this was also the year that we were starting really bad inflation. And, um, and an oil crisis was on its way that would hit hard in October. Um, not the best time to plan a family vacation, but my parents, for whatever reason, decided um, to take us on our one and only family vacation the summer of 1973. And that was in a suburban with um, their five daughters plus a friend, because five girls is not enough, and the dog and a Jayco trailer with the capacity of eight people. We crammed a dog in there as well and decided to go on a trip to Disneyland. Now we started in Santa Fe, New Mexico. So you're thinking that's not that big of a deal. Um, well, we went, it took us 12,000 miles to get to Disneyland. We went all the way around the country, up into Canada, Canada and back down. Now this trip um, <laughs> kind of comes up for me because it was a ride I couldn't get off of. And I can remember the preparation and my parents being really excited now that we would go on weekend camping trips and that was the extent of our family vacation ever. And this summer my dad wasn't working so they were hyping us up. Disneyland was the carrot that was dangling at the end. We will go to Disneyland. And, um, but I can remember the preparations like packing, like what clothes are you gonna bring for two and a half months? Like what books? You could only bring a certain number of books um, you know, postcard, you know, writing utensils to write postcards to your best friend. Like there was all this and then the haircuts. So my mother took us down to the beauty shop and all of us got pixies and, um, and away we went. 
And I'm going to do a little time travel because I'm going to jump to um, February and March of 2020 um, when my wife and I were hearing about a virus that's coming down the pike and New York State's starting to shut down and we're getting a little bit panicked. And it's like, oh, if we start shutting down, I better go get my hair cut. So I went and I got my hair cut and, <laughs> cut and colored. And, you know, we started thinking about like, you know, well, if we shut down, like maybe we should make sure our library card is, is up to date and make sure that we have everything prepped up. And I'm hearing toilet paper. There's maybe a run on toilet paper and should we invest in a, in a bidet? And, you know, those conversations are coming up. So, um, you know, kind of similar, a little bit of prep going on. Well, flipping back to 1973, um, we were all really excited. It was novelty. It was like, oh my gosh, we're going to have so much fun. We have so much fun when we go camping for three days. So much fun. Two and a half months is going to be a hoot. So we all climb into the Suburban and we take off. And the first few days are wonderful. We're singing. We're a big musical family. My mother, we used to listen to musicals on Sunday mornings and we would memorize the entire thing. And Carol, our friend, was in the musicals as well. So, you know, we did the Wizard of Oz full with full dialogue from the movie. Like we, the entire film. Um, we had done it three times by the time we hit mid-Texas. Um, Texas is a very large state. Um, and it's right next to New Mexico. So it didn't take that long. Um, filler on the roof, sound of music. We went through the whole musical routine by the time we hit Texas. Um, Kind of like, you know, flipping to 2020, my, my wife and I were doing these little videos, we're posting pictures about our pets, it's novelty, everyone zoom, zoom, zooming all the time. But then the novelty wears off. Around Kansas, our friend Carol decides that she did not choose her bubble well in 1973, and she wants to go home. She wants to go home so badly. She hates our family. She wants to go home to her parents. My dad is like, you made the choice. You either go on a bus, she felt it was too risky, so she stayed for the remainder of the trip, um, crying silently at night. Um, you know, 2020, did you make the right choice to go stay with your parents during a pandemic that you thought would be three weeks long? Maybe not the right choice, but you made the choice, you're going to have to stick it out. As we made our way up the East Coast, we we're from New Mexico. We were surprised to find out that there were people who did not know things like they didn't know New Mexico was a state. Um, wondered if we spoke Spanish and if we rode horses and oh, we had a car. Um, the things that people did not know surprised me. Like I was shocked that people did not know New Mexico was a state. Um, Flipping to now, I'm still not shocked, really. It does not surprise me what people don't know in this day and age, does not surprise me. Um, the middle of the trip, I kind of remember, you know, it kind of goes into just like this blur, like the Dakotas were hot and Canada was clean. The United States in 1973 was a litter pile and Canada it was like they polished the streets. It was really clean. Um, kind of like how April or May kind of felt, May and June just kind of blurred by one day, just kind of goes into another when you're just so used to being at home. But I forgot to mention Maine. Maine was huge. Maine was the place that we got to go out for a restaurant meal for the first time and the only time in the two and a half month trip. It was one of the smaller carrots dangled that we will go into a restaurant. We were cooking every meal at, in that Jayco trailer. My mother prepared three meals a day in the Jayco or on the road. We were so excited we got to go have Maine Lobster and we had to wear bibs. And even though we didn't want to wear bibs, we wore the bibs to eat the lobster. Could not have the lobster without wearing the bibs. <clears throat> I'm just gonna leave that analogy alone. We go traveling over, we hit the upper Northwest coast. Um, this is when the dog has diarrhea. Oh, it was hilarious. They love to joke about it now. Still to this day, they joke about the day that Jennifer woke up in a pile of crap from the dog who had diarrhea in Seattle. <laughs> Hilarity, hilarious. <laughs> when we got to the Northwest, Disneyland was really kind of in sight, but we had to get through Washington and Oregon. And that meant my mother found in Washington state the Rainier Cherry. I don't know if you've ever had Rainier cherries. They have them here. They're really delicious. But in Washington, where they've just been picked, they are amazing. 
my mom every for the two for washington and oregon every grocery store every vegetable stand every fruit stand she would buy a pound of friggin rainier cherries so we're eating all these cherries all through oregon my mother every time you turn around oh i just love these rainier cherries they're so good i just can't believe it we get to california and at the border you can't take fruit over the border from any other state to get into california no rainier cherries my mother doesn't understand it. It's a delicate balance. You don't want to upset the agricultural balance between Oregon and California. You have to respect that. So my mother made my dad pull off to the side of the road and we had to eat every Rainier cherry that we had. We're shoving Rainier cherries down. Like three weeks later, my mother found a rogue Rainier cherry under her seat and ate it. Ew! We couldn't believe it. We're like, that's been in there for like three weeks underneath that seat, hot seat. My mother still ate the rainier cherry. That takes me to 2020. When traveling, if you are going to states, they all have their different rules and what they allow and what they don't allow with people coming over their borders. Not to upset the, the not to upset that apple cart. So respect the border, learn the rules before you step over. Eat the cherry. Now we get to Disneyland and where I'm going to break a little bit of a rule because back at the prep of this trip, by now my hair has grown out. I look just like Christy McNichol, which wasn't that bad, but my two younger sisters also, we look like the stages of Christy McNichol. We all have this shag, shaggy hair from being in the car for, you know, two and a half months. And, um, and we are, we get to Disneyland and I am a 10 year old tough skin wearing tomboy. I mean, I am in the hills, I'm playing all the time. And when we get to California, my mother decides, and she had packed it, we had had a fight back in Santa Fe, and she had packed a dress, one dress for me for the trip, which I had avoided. Even the main lobster, I had avoided the dress. I was gonna make it to Santa Fe without having to put on this sickly, sherbet, rainbow colored dress. And she pulled it out on Disneyland day and said, you're wearing the dress. And this is where I say, I do have the prop. This is the dress. This is the 10 year old dress that I had to wear with a matching kerchief, no less, if I was gonna go to Disneyland. Well, um, Leia, <laughs> the tantrum you heard from your, that you thought you were gonna hear from your kids, my mother heard in Anaheim, California, when I was told that I had to wear this stupid dress to Disneyland. I hated the dress. It wasn't me. I would wear culottes. I would wear a sport. I did not want to wear the matching kerchief. It was embarrassing. It didn't say who I was. How dare you make me wear this? No one else had to wear a dress. None of my other sisters had to wear a dress. I'm sure no one at Disneyland had to wear a dress. But at the end of the day, I wanted to go to Disneyland and I had to wear the dress. So I'm gonna to flip to 2020 and I'm gonna take it into the now. And I'm gonna say, yes, Disneyland is still there. The carrot is dangling. And one day we will all be able to go to Disneyland. But please, until then, and when you do, just suck it up and wear the dress. Thank you. Th thank you, Jennifer. That still looks terrific, by the way. I, I can't believe it. If I, if I could have a suit in that, uh, in that fabric, I would absolutely wear it. Um, any uh, any uh, uh, takeaways uh, other than what you've already shared? Uh, from the <laughs> well, I, felt, I felt like I answered the question. You, you might I have it covered. We, you might have it I covered. I heard that I was talking about the pandemic, but I can't help, you know, it's kind of where we are. Um, I think I've learned that I was not as social as I thought I was. Like my life hasn't changed that much, sadly. Um, I, I thought I was much more social and did a lot more. <laughs> but in fact, I find that I'm kind of a homebody. And um, I work remotely with one of my jobs and then, you know, the theater, art will happen. I guess that's what I've got to learn is that we're going to continue to do this. And that's what we have to just stay with that hope and know that Disneyland, you know, it will end. The two and a half month trip ends. You're able to get out of the car at some point. Right. Well, thanks again, Jennifer. Thank you, uh, Mike. Good to see you. As always, a pleasure. All right, our next storyteller. Wayne Bell is a local carpenter, teacher, 
Minister, Manchester Selectman, and current Vice Chair, Justice of the Peace, and sometimes Shanaki, an Irish American storyteller. He was well, a well known Manchester restaurateur for many years, operating Yield Tavern in the 80s and the quality restaurant on Main Street for over 16 years. In 2007, he was the Grand Marshal for the Bennington County St. Patrick's Day Parade and currently, with his wife, hosts gatherings at Seamus O'Dowd, uh, O'Dowden's Public House and Shabine. Uh, welcome, Wayne Bell. Thank you, Michael. Hi, everybody. Um, in the words of a, a great storyteller that I wish was here today, Patrick Monroe, this is a, a true story. His never were, but um, mine actually is. Um, I've been blessed to have four younger, lovely sisters that I have, whose lives I've shared since they were born. And the one thing that I've wondered over the years is what it would have been like to have a brother. Um, in my seven decades, I've had uh, friendships that I would imagine were kind of like a brother, but I've always wondered what it would have really been like if, if one of my sisters were my brother. So 20 years ago, on uh, Christmas Eve, my wife Tara and I were hosting our usual um, Christmas Eve open house. It was uh, late in the evening, it was getting dark, there was a knock at the door and a friend of ours, an artist friend, uh, Tess, was at the door. I opened the door in the frigid air and snow flurries and she's standing there with our dog in her arms, our little Jack Russell, Seamus. I said, Tara, Seamus got out. And Tara looks at me and says, no, he's right there. I look down and there's Seamus and I look back at Tess and there's Seamus. This is very confusing. Um, he's a dead ringer. It looks just like our dog. So she tells me um, that she had found him uh, running down Main Street in the village. Uh, she stopped the car. She called out Seamus and this little dog with no collar, dead ringer for our dog, jumps in the car and she decides, okay, I'm going over for Christmas Eve. I'll bring Seamus home. All good. Um, you know, over the years, we've had a number of Jack Russells. They all have kind of similar personality quirks. They're in your face and, and uh, energetic, um, but they all look quite different. So uh, the fact that this little dog uh, looked just like ours was kind of mystifying. Anyway, in the door, they came, joined our public house gathering and um, Everybody just had a great time. Tara, uh, in our house at Christmas, is kind of a magical time, so she immediately tagged him with the moniker Tiny Tim. Uh, our Seamus was a, a bit of a character. Some of you know about him. Uh, he could be a little bristly uh, when it came to other dogs or, uh, for that matter, anything at all. It wasn't all about him. Uh, to be fair, my wife did kind of ruin him for... Uh, a normal life by constantly photographing him and dressing him and um, he could be very hospitable with people. He is, after all, the namesake of our, our public house and he welcomed everybody into the house. The only problem with Seamus was if you tried to leave, that was when he would likely bite you. So um, he was pretty famous. He uh, was in a book called Vermont Dogs. Uh, he was photographed diving off the uh, cliffs at the Dorset Quarry. Um, there were Seamus calendars. Every month there would be a different theme and he would be dressed up. Uh, and he did seem to thrive on all of this, but it certainly wasn't normal. Christmas was a really hard time for Seamus. Uh, if someone else got a present, he would howl piteously. But this Christmas, to our astonishment with Tiny Tim, he absolutely settled in. He was uh, very generous. He shared his treats. He shared the attention. Um, uncharacteristically generous. Uh, that was really, really baffling. At any rate, um, 
convinced that somebody must be looking for this handsome little dog, I called the dispatcher and asked him if there'd been any inquiries and there had not. So I told him, uh, I gave him a description and told him uh, where he was when somebody did call. I expected that to happen. So our festivities carried on through the evening and finally uh, uh, at the end of the evening, he'd had a great time with all our guests. Um, everybody was heading out and uh, we were left with, well, what are we gonna do about Tiny Tim, this little dog? So I said, well, I called the dispatcher again, still nobody's looking for him. Uh, like Seamus, he was lovable. I had the sense that if he stayed here too long, that could be a problem. Tara rounded up and monogrammed a, a Christmas stocking and put doggy treats in for the next morning. And we headed up to bed and little Tim jumped up into bed with the rest of, with the Seamus and us like he'd always been there. So this was getting pretty eerie. Christmas morning, we all came downstairs. We opened presents, we had breakfast. The dogs were racing around as if they were joined at the hip. Tara was completely smitten and asked, can we keep him? I said, no, of course not. Somebody is looking for him. Um, but still, we got no calls. Um, after uh, the wrapping paper and breakfast dishes were all cleaned up, uh, the dogs were exhausted. They're sleeping by the hearth. It's time we usually set out and go around and visit our neighbors and folks around town. What are we going to do with Tiny Tim? Maybe I should call the dispatcher again, or I don't know, maybe I shouldn't. Uh, well, I should, but all right. So at this point, we're hoping that nobody's looking because uh, we're starting to get used to him and we kind of like this idea and our Seamus absolutely loves this idea. But I call and um, the dispatcher says, oh yeah, somebody just called. Uh, All right, yes, yes, give me the number. Okay, Tara's crestfallen. Turned out some folks from Colorado visiting family in the village uh, had found out he was missing this morning and uh, no, oh well. Um, He's been claimed. Half hour later, we welcomed the woman who'd been searching for her dog named Barely. Uh, we shared the story of how Tess had found him and how we'd been calling him Tiny Tim and how amazed we were that he looked so much like Seamus. How old is Barely? Oh, Seamus is seven too. Where did he come from? She told us that she'd gotten him from a breeder in New York. I said, well, we got Seamus uh, from a breeder in Lake Cassiuna, also in New York. Oh, she did too. Well, it turns out Seamus, the runt of the litter, seven years ago, um, was the brother of Tiny Tim, now known as Barely. So imagine not having seen each other since they were six weeks old, Barely somehow found his way all the way back from Colorado visit of the brother he lost all those years ago. Amazing, truly a Christmas miracle. I couldn't even imagine what the odds of that would be. And I wondered if he, like me, uh, if Seamus ever thought about what it would be like to have a brother. Uh, but unlike me, he found out that Vermont Christmas evening. So those dogs are both long gone now, but every Christmas we hang a photo of Seamus and Barely on the refrigerator. And we remember that wonderful Christmas visit. Thanks. Thank you, Wayne. I, I'll tell you, I hear uh, amazing chance encounter stories from people that, you know, run into somebody in New York City that they know. I, I think I'm more amazed by the chance encounter of two dogs. Uh, that's that's really quite the story. Um, any uh, anything, any surprises or anything that you've learned over the last four and a half months you, you can share? Well, 2020 um, confirmed for me the wisdom of the, uh, the old country song. God is great, beer is good, and people are crazy. <laughs> yeah, um, sums it up. <laughs> sincerely, sincerely, though, uh, you know, it's a reminder, uh, especially in times of trouble, how important family and friends are. 
Um, I mentioned that I have four sisters and one of the nice things to come out of this uh, and the Zoom thing is that we have um, been very disciplined about checking in with each other every week. And so we have a little family meeting and, you know, we were probably more cavalier about that before, but now uh, it seems kind of really important that we do that. And we've also promised to keep that up uh, when and if things calm down. So, so that's kind of the blessing of, of this. That's a, that's a significant silver lining right there. Well, it thank is. you again, Wayne Bell. You're very welcome. Um, our final storyteller of the evening, Rabbi, Rabbi Bob Alper, served large synagogues in Buffalo and Philadelphia, experiences that naturally prepared him for his 34-year career as a full-time stand-up comic. He performs across North America and the Caribbean, Israel and Europe, and is heard regularly on Sirius XM satellite radio. Bob earned a doctorate from Princeton Theological Seminary and is the author of three books. Northshire residents simply know him as Sherry Alpert's husband who tells jokes in the Isles of Shaw's. Uh, welcome, Rabbi Bob Alper. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. A pleasure listening to my colleagues' uh, wonderful, wonderful stories, inspiring stories. Um, so I am a comedian, um, and one of my heroes is Steve Martin, not only because people tell me I look like him, and by the way, if you want to be a comedian, it's good to look like Steve Martin. I couldn't make it if I looked like Charles Manson. So uh, that was good. I listened to him, though, for wisdom. Uh, Steve Martin has a line where he says, uh, the opposite of comedy uh, is uh, 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 distraction. Distraction is the opposite of comedy. Comedy, you have to be very careful that all the, the I's are dotted, all the T's are crossed, but the audience is quiet and they're listening, they're attentive. I spent many years, uh, 14 years uh, in congregations and officiated at, at probably seven or 800 weddings. And the same, the same thing obtains for weddings, that distraction can ruin a wedding. Children in weddings are not appropriate. I've seen so many disasters, even though I counsel against having children in weddings, that they distract. And there are other distractions that I try and handle uh, as the officiant. So when I would do a wedding, uh, I would first, before it would begin, I would talk to the photographer and explain my rules, gentle rules. I would say, look, um, when the couple is walking in, when they're processing, when they're recessing, take all the pictures that you want. When they get to me, uh, I'm going to stop for a while and you from wherever you want to be, take a picture of them in front of me. And then we'll begin the ceremony. And at that point, I would ask no further pictures. Uh, then they could start again when, when they're recessing. And the photographers are, are very cooperative. It's, it works well. Um, but sometimes if uh, people are involved and if, if they're running late, I don't get to talk to the photographer. Um, the uh, you know, they might be taking last minute pictures. People might have arrived late and they have to get them in the group shots. That's okay. I had a way of dealing with it where uh, I would begin the ceremony and look out and say, in order to preserve the solemnity of these moments, I would ask that no further pictures be taken until the recessional. It's very clear. It's very simple. It always worked. One time I was officiating a wedding and I made that same announcement. I didn't have a chance to talk to the photographer. Uh, I made that announcement and began the ceremony. About two minutes in, I felt a flash from about one third of the way up on the right side. I looked over and there was the photographer now readjusting his camera. So I very pleasantly, I said, please, no further pictures until the end of the ceremony. Another couple minutes went by and another flash, this time from the left side. And again, I looked over and there was the photographer adjusting his camera, looking down. And I was annoyed. I was more than annoyed. And I felt I had to do something too because it was ruining the wedding. So I said, would one of the ushers kindly escort the photographer from the room, which he did. The ceremony ended. The first thing that happened before we even left the front of the room, the father of the bride said, Rabbi, you did the right thing. That guy was really obnoxious. We had the uh, reception. I, I never stayed for 
the meal because it's not in my uh, playbook to, to want to spend two hours shouting at someone above a band, someone I'd never meet again. Uh, so I didn't stay for the reception, but I always had a drink and an hors d'oeuvre. And a number of people came up to me and said, you handled that very well, Rabbi. That was, that was so inappropriate what he did. And uh, you, you saved the way. I was feeling good. I was feeling kind of pumped up. I, you know, did the right thing. And then it was time to leave. I gathered my, my uh, book and uh, my coat, and uh, I was walking to the front exit of this hall, wherever it was held. And as I got in view of the front door, I noticed there on a bench next to the front door sat the photographer rummaging in his bag of, uh, of photography equipment. And I thought, is there another way out of here? I don't want to confront him. He probably doesn't want to confront me. But there was no other way out. And I had to leave by him. So I gritted my teeth and I started walking toward him and he looked up and he caught my eye. And I caught his just for a second. And then he looked down again. And I kept on walking toward him. And then he turned to the side. And for the first time, I noticed that he was wearing a hearing aid. And then he continued to look to the left and then turned to the right to get into another bag of his equipment. And I noticed he had a hearing aid in the other ear too. Now it's been about 30 years since that happened. As I mentioned, I officiated hundreds of weddings. That's the moment I remember. I think about it often. I think I did the right thing by asking him to leave the room. He was disturbing the wedding. I think it was the right thing to do. But still, but still, I wish some way, somehow, I could meet the photographer, that I could look at him face to face, eye to eye, and say in a loud voice that he might be able to hear, or perhaps read my lips and say to him, I'm really sorry. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bob. That's wonderful. Um, before, we, uh, before we move on, uh, any, uh, anything you, you'd like to share, surprises or discoveries uh, over the past four months? Yeah, I, I, you know, I've, I've been doing stand-up for a long time, 30 years, and it's evolutionary. I, I finally, I decided, I realized there's a holiness to laughter. It's not simply recreation, it's not simply diversion. When this whole thing began, I decided that I wanted to put a joke, a, a, a piece of humor online every day. And I developed what I call Quick Laugh, a website called Quick Laugh, not a website, it's, a, it's an email called Quick Laugh that I send out every day at 10 o'clock with a little quick laugh from my routine, about 70 of them, or 20 jokes that I tell, all in front of an audience. They're videos, but they're quick. You know, it's not an investment of time. Uh, within 40 seconds, it's over. So I've been sending them out. Um, people, if they want to register, just go to my website, bobalper.com, B-O-B-A-L-P-E-R.com. And on the upper right, you can, you can click and, and register. And every day you'll get one at, at, uh, at 10 o'clock. And I've gotten a lot of reaction. The one that I will remember forever came about three weeks into this. A rabbi from Long Island wrote to me. He said, in the past week, I've had five funerals, four COVID related, and your jokes are what keep me going. So I think there's an important spiritual value in humor. I'm happy to be a part of it. And uh, I hope everyone who's listening has a chance to, uh, uh, to laugh uh, uh, and to uh, find enjoyment in these really scary and difficult times. Well, that's wonderful. Thank you very much, Bob. Um, so basically, uh, in, in MC 101 uh, class, they, you know, an MC always ends an event by saying, what a great night we've had and what a great lineup we've had. But I, I really mean it. This has been a wonderful uh, group of storytellers and a wonderful night of stories. Um, so in just a minute, uh, we're going to ask Ray uh, to unmute everybody 
and see what happens if we allow and try to do a, a round of applause, applause and any hooting and hollering, whatever we want to do. But before that chaos, um, I, and I'm not sure if uh, Cindy uh, had any uh, other remarks before we end. If so, I'll let her jump in. In the meantime, uh, thank you to the Manchester Community Library for this event. Thank you uh, to co-sponsor Northshire Bookstore. Uh, the event organizer, Cindy Waters, and uh, all of our technical assistants, which is so important, Ray Stevens. Thank you very much. And to our storytellers, Bob Stannard, Dave Canal, Leah Moore, Jennifer Jasper, Wayne Bell, Rabbi Bob Alper, and I'm Michael Nigro. Thank you, everybody, for a wonderful evening. Ray? All right, so I am about to hit the button that will allow each of you to unmute yourselves. Uh, you can do this by clicking or tapping the microphone icon in the bottom left of your screen. And that should be in effect now. So hey. Hey. Thank you, Mike, it was awesome. <laughs> that was delicious. Thank you so much, what a gift you all gave to our community. We can't thank you enough. Thank you.